other thing. I have to get my agenda back up now. Hello, new people who are visiting us. It's wonderful to see you <sighs> or hear your names. How are you? Randall. Is there. Okay. Sure, Brock's co-hosting this. Is that everybody? Oh, regional. Yes, I believe sorry, everybody I is in now. Great. We're doing right. Okay. Brian okay. and Terry, can you please mute yourselves? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Would you all be so kind as to stand in your own abode for the Pledge to the Flag? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, 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 America and to the republic, the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, for all. all. Thank you. Jean, thank you for the flag. That's very nice. <laughs> Okay, um, where are we? Okay, we are on number five then, public comment. Public, welcome. Do, does anybody have a comment they wish to make at this moment? Okay, then we're going to move to number six. Presentation, hey, so student engagement, Sullivan BOCES in a remote learning environment. It's informational. So this is a presentation that we had promised you at the November board meeting. Um, we had been discussing attendance, student engagement, and virtual or remote learning. So Natasha and her staff, uh, or Natasha and her staffs, have prepared a, a presentation to give you an overview as to what remote learning at Sullivan BOCES looks like. So I'm going to turn it over at this time to uh, Natasha and to uh, Maria, um, we will provide you with a copy of this presentation and um, the links uh, that you see in them as well. Good evening, everyone. I just want to thank um, our guests tonight who are joining us within the presentation. So we have two teachers, Randall Wright and Jen Brock, and also two of our administrators, Megan and Adam. So thank you for joining us. So last month we talked about attendance. This month we're gonna talk about engagement. And as a background, there are national and local discussions going on as we speak about remote instruction. Um, there are a couple national reports. One is the playbook, which I have a link in here for you if you wanna peruse it. Um, this is an ongoing discussion about attendance um, in our country. And there's actually a specific COVID response to attendance um, that's embedded within the attendance playbook. We also have um, research behind um, our MTSS, which is multi tier systems of support um, regarding attendance and student engagement and um, gauging students progress. And the COVID collaborative, which is new this year, it's a national uh, think tank um, who is examining the ways uh, COVID has impacted schooling, in particular around student engagement. And um, they talked about online learning and ways that, that learning works. So here's a little snippet of it on the screen. Um, and there's actually a link here if you wanna go on further. There are also state and local discussion groups going on. Um, Bob's group for the state superintendents group are talking about it. Our SCDN, which is our Staff Curriculum Development Network in New York State, BOCES, um, our statewide special ed groups, countywide assistant superintendent groups, and our principal meetings. This is an ongoing discussion about student engagement. So what does research tell us about remote instru instruction and student engagement? <clears throat> Number one is teacher-student relationships matter. Um, Multi-tiered systems of supports and an emphasis on social emotional learning. Those were part of our reopening plan requirements. Um, those are evidence-based frameworks and those are effective in getting students supported in the work that they do in school, not only during COVID, um, but in um, regular times. 
And students need to be provided with equitable opportunities, whether they're remote or in person. Um, those things need to be equitable for de the demands of students. So some students learn in remote better than they do in person and vice versa. Uh, we also know that teachers need support uh, professionally, um, learning new tools and tricks, and you'll see some of that tonight. And um, there is also statewide and local discussions going around about attendance and how do we engage students to come to school, just getting them to school. And that's part of the work of that I mentioned before, the attendance playbook. So one of the things um, also in the study was about improving attendance. Mm -hmm. And we started looking as a principal group, looking at our process for attendance and it's displayed here. Um, we started breaking down daily impacts and engagement towards attendance, consecutive attendance, non-consecutive days of attendance, and how we're communicating. So these are some of the ways we've been shifting our thinking. And I'll go in a little bit later on where we're gonna go from there at the end of the presentation. We also, um, part of the, the 10 ways to make online learning work um, research and what we're also doing here is shifting the way we deliver instruction. So we're thinking about the instructional time that we're using, what's the best bang for our buck during time for instruction. Um, we implemented daily check-ins for our social emotional framework. Um, we use two different platforms, Seesaw for our younger learners where they can record and write directly into the app and Google Classroom for our, our little bit older group of students. And we have independent, small group, conferencing, uh, group projects, informal parent training by our teachers going on, and parent consult. And that's either through the IEP as part of the IEP process or informal um, where parents might need support. And overall, what is effective, um, part of our MTSS, which is new this year, um, is ongoing evaluation of our program. So we do have a team that started for our reopening and has continued the work. Um, every three weeks we meet and evaluate our programming and think of new ways to um, work with our different teams. All the principals and administrators are part of that team and we have teachers and TAs on that team as well in related services. So it goes back to the individual um, programs to think more critically um, of the supports and then comes back to the big team every three weeks. So next we're gonna see some examples of remote learning. We have two teachers, Jen Brock and Randall Wright, who are gonna be presenting their virtual classrooms, one in Seesaw from Jen for the um, younger students and Randall Wright's gonna give you an overview and their, their takeaways from re remote learning. And then towards the end, um, we're gonna have a Q&A session for open questions from the board um, for our administrators and teachers who are here. So I'm just gonna play, um, and this is Ms. Brock, a little intro to her. I'll play only a few snippets and you can have access to this presentation to um, watch the whole clip, but I'll just do a few seconds for each slide so you get a taste. Celebrate, is everybody oh. ready? So you'll see some of the PBIS strategies built into the um, instructional program from Ms. Conklin. And I must have forwarded uh, Ms. Brock. Three, two, three, four. So you'll see here how she's sharing her screen with her students and engaging students online and the TAs during remote instruction. Butterfly, can you say butterfly? Okay, butterfly. Okay. Um, Miss Johnstone um, is part of our 811 elementary and she's using a gaming technique to get kids engaged in learning. So we all know kids like video games. Oh, 
no, it's skipping ahead of me. Hi, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Classcraft. Classcraft is a behavior management program set in a game format. All of the kids these days are used to gaming and the creators of this program decided to gamify um, what we do in the classroom. I really like it. I've been using this program for about five years in person and since March remotely, and it really does help with engagement. So each student is given an avatar and the avatar gains points or loses points based on classroom expectations that I set up. The program comes with tons and tons of presets that you can use, or you can completely customize it for your classroom. So each student um, gets an avatar and their avatar gains or loses privileges and powers based on what my classroom expectations are. So I like to start each meet with class craft and I don't have to choose all of these. I can just pick one thing that I'm focusing on or I could pick as many as I want for that student to gain points. So what I so if you want to go back and listen more to how she's using gaming and how it's designed. Um, some of our related services, um, one of the pieces that they were struggling with is all the manipulatives they have to use for students, especially our younger students that are hands on. And they were trying to figure out um, interesting ways to adapt to our remote learners to make it equitable between our at home students and in person students. So we have one of our speech teachers down or else we get a lot of feedback. And now I'm going to set this up. I just don't want it to be upside down, which sometimes it likes to do. All right, I'm still kind of new at this. Let's see if it's upside down or not. Okay, all right. So again, it's a good way for therapists to use the materials that they already own um, during this transition time, you know, we've all had to go online and find things within mm -hmm. the, the net to use, but I've found a way for me. So this is a set of my adjective cards. Are they right side up for you? They are. They are. Okay. They are for me too. So I could just take a deck of cards that we already own as a, as a therapist, as a BOCES and run my child through dirty, clean, dirty, clean. Okay. Okay. And of course, school has to be fun at all times um, to get kids engaged. So one of the things um, we've been improving on and enhancing in our school is our PBIS program, our Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. So here you'll see um, at White Sulphur, they do TikTok Thursdays. Has everyone heard of TikTok? So it's a little dance. Um, so they've been recruiting teachers and staff to be, participate in TikTok and also with their parents and students at home. So I'll do a little clip. And of course, they go, our PE teachers go way out and make actual movies of this, so. Oh boy. One leg in, one leg out, other leg in, other leg out. And we gon' rock, 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 rock. And she gon' rock, rock. And of course, here's our parent and student duo. <laughs> He's proud of his mom for participating. So, and just some little fun that goes on that we call it um, teachers off guard. So you can see how they're enjoying their remote learning. Oh. And of course, Miss Brock's joining in. <laughs> so this is what you'll see in the elementary school with remote learners. So I'm going to stop my share and Miss Brock is going to share her screen and just walk you through Seesaw, which is the primary um, platform that our K-3s use. I should be able to share, right? Just by clicking yep. the green arrow? Yep. Okay.
Good evening, everyone, by the way. So what you're looking at, can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. In the top left corner says, teacher, Ms. Brock. So here, our seesaw platform in our elementary, I have kindergarten to second graders. Um, this is predominantly used for independent use of the students when they are not in Google Meets. So we put assignments on there. It sends it to both the, um, often it sends it to the parents' email and to the students' email telling them what has been assigned to them. So to meet all of their needs, I'm going to show you some of the assignments so that you can see how easy it is for them to do it. Wash those items. So here is one where a student had to trace the letters and Ms. Becker and I worked really hard at making sure all of our students who couldn't use the mouse or the Chromebook got iPads at home and I've seen a big progress in the number of students who are participating on the seesaw once they had iPads because they're touch screen and they can actually use their fingers to do all of the circling and the tracing of the letters. So here you're going to hear one of the little girls telling us what it is and what sound. A so they record themselves or even the students who can't do the writing portion of it, they can record their answers for each thing, which is one of the things most of us elementary teachers loved about Seesaw was that it was more user friendly for both the parents and the student to be able to use. So you can see where they're, they're working at tracing the letters. This is a skill both the OT and myself will tell you in the developmental level that my students are at, these are our skill they need to practice a lot. So you can hear he's saying, but so that's seesaw. One of the things that I use when I do my Google Meets is my Google Slides. So can you see my Google Slide right now? It says, what can you drink? Okay. So this is a student I want to tell you about. When I got her in September, she commonly used one word utterances. So if I showed her a picture, which I'm assuming all of you can see a little boy blowing his nose, well, she would say blow. She would say color. She didn't put two words together, a noun and a verb, or she couldn't put an adjective and a, and a noun together. She didn't have that skill set yet. So everything she would answer both to myself, the speech team, and her mom was always one word utterances or often nothing. So from September till now, not only has she increased her ability to identify two words, noun, verb, verb, noun, she has actually started answering WH questions. She has started being able to identify features and functions of objects. So this is a typical screen, a Google slide that I create for each individual child. And it tells us what their targets are at this current learning period. And it's based on their developmental learning level. So if you look really close, I have an RP 1215 written at the bottom. It means this child actually retained this. I tested her, I asked her, she got it right. I did all of these um, today. So I'm gonna go through and show you a couple. And here's how I keep my student engaged. As I'm asking her these questions and I'm testing her, I get all of her favorite videos. And then I simply play them for a minute or two until I get her and she's paying attention, go to a couple more questions. She, and then she gets the reward of getting the video throughout the questions. So side note, something I really want you to know is that mom sitting next to her as we're doing this you know, a couple of days of this intense type teaching, a couple of days of the fun read aloud videos. And she has made so much progress that these questions like, what do you sleep in? She automatically says bed. Here's another one. What do you build with? She now says blocks. What do you bounce? Balls. So she's now identifying features and functions, things that she wasn't doing at all before. And it's so wonderful. Her mom told me this past last week that they went to the dollar store and her daughter said to her mom, I want the yellow star balloon. Her mom said it's the first time in the last two years she's ever just pointed out exactly what she wanted that she didn't have to ask her, 
what do you want? What color is it? What does it look like? Where did you see it? Because all she was telling her mom was one thing. So mom was so excited. And again, I'm so excited that this is working virtually that they're learning. They're making great progress. I keep a daily track of every time I work with her on a sh question sheet. I kind of put it in here just so you can see it. Everything in pink is when she got it correct. And all the things in yellow is when she got it correct consecutively three different days. So if you just see all the pink and all the yellow, she's making great progress in a matter of weeks. So it's working. We're keeping them engaged. She's getting the right answers. She's retaining it. We're coming back and asking her it more than once. And we do it with multiple people so that she doesn't just always rely on being able to answer me. I do breakout rooms and my other staff will be working one-on-one -on -one with her and she'll give them the correct answers. So we know that she's retaining the information. I'm gonna quickly show you one other way that we keep our children engaged. So here is a math slide that we like to, we start with the basic one, two, three identification. And then as they get better at it, we go up. So I'm gonna see if this will let me present, perfect. So we even tried to make it fun. So if they click the right great answer, job. it tells them great job. And if they click the wrong answer, try again. So those are the kind of things that we've tried to do to keep them engaged. A really important thing I want you to know with our population is that my students cannot even get on the iPad or the computer without their parents right next to them. We have, we have asked parents to always be in the room while we're working with them because even something as simple as muting and unmuting yourself, not all of my students are developmentally at a level where they can comprehend how to do that so the parents are sitting next to them. So because so many of my parents have seen the progress of what their kids are doing because now they're actually watching and engaged because they're sitting next to them and they see the language increasing in their children. And some of them are even telling me that they're seeing the behavior decreasing because now instead of the girl in the store stomping her feet and screaming because mom's not understanding her, she totally explained to mom what she wanted, got what she wanted, no problem behavior. So I have now created certificates for my parents, for parent of the month who has participated because without them, I couldn't do my job at this point my student who wants to go run away, if she's not sitting next to him and helping with the computer skills, I, I couldn't do it. So we are so grateful. I have found my parents are very engaged and involved. I won't tell you all of them. There are still a couple of kids here and there that are having, parents are having difficulties finding the time to get their kids on. But for the most part, I've really seen a lot of participation because my parents are saying, wow, I see progress with my students, with their children. And I, I can honestly say that the two students who are completely virtual for me are making such great progress using this method, the seesaw, and another, a newer thing that I started. Once Google Meets had breakout rooms, I started using the breakout rooms where each staff member was in a room with one student and they did a science or a social studies activity for 10 minutes. And then we came back and switched and they went with a different person. My student went all the faces are on the screen like we are right now. Very often it's too distracting. So I found that is so much less distracting. They're focusing on one adult and the screen and they definitely are getting the answers and responding. So overall, I have found it to be a lot more resources you have to use, a lot more tricks in your bag you have to have, but Overall, I feel like my students are making progress because of all of the things that we have created and we're using. So thank you for giving us these resources. Wow, sounds wonderful, thank you. That was thank great. You. So I have to say when we were practicing today and Jen was talking about our parent certificates, um, Mr. Wright is stealing that idea because <laughs> that's what we do as teachers. So um, great. Um, 
these are great um, ways for teachers to, to great, get great ideas. And I think there's a lot of that going on as well. So I know Jen has been a big arm in um, working with other teachers um, to do collaborative um, ideas and, and resources to make the work of what online learning is a little bit less for teachers. So thank you, Jen, so much. Um, oh, I got to share my screen, sorry. So I'm gonna, our two PE teachers um, on the screen, they are a dynamic duo. They do um, our elementary through high school students, but they can't come up with some of the most incredible videos. So I'm just gonna give you, here's one where they're trying to integrate things that they can do, students can do at home without resources. Um, they just have to watch the video and they can find space in their home or outside on the sidewalk and do some of the activities. So they're not needing the resources they may need in school to do physical activity. Oh. Today, let's make our own chalk walk. All you need is some sidewalk chalk and a safe sidewalk. Be creative and making some fun obstacles. Have fun and move your body every day. On your mark. Get that. Go. You can do it. You can do it. Go, 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 go. Ready, set, go. Go, 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 go. Bunny breath. Take three quick inhales through your nose. And here's our latest um, winter theme. Okay, kids, you know it's important to move your body every day. So here is a winter themed activity for us to do. Follow along and enjoy. Happy December. On the first day of winter, my teacher said you be a snowflake as big as can be. On the second day of winter, my teacher said you be two snow angels. So I have to tell you, I ask, I ask them at least once a week, I need to see a video because they're so fun to watch. So um, thank you to our PE teachers. Um, next up is our secondary school experience. Um, here's one of our science teachers and he's um, in a Google Meet. Okay, Albert, Albert, why don't you quickly share about Oh, are you, uh, can you, can you um, paraphrase them for us? Can you put them in your own words? Or I didn't, I couldn't hear. Okay, or why don't you just give me, is it a herbivore or a carnivore? Herbivore, okay. And what period? Cretaceous, okay. Uh, and I saw the picture on the stream, so, um, all right. Yesterday, didn't you? Oh, that was the one, that was the one on I want to know more about the one on Did you see the joke I put yesterday? So he goes into a screen and goes through his stream, which is the feed where kids can add jokes. And he uses that to engage students in the content. So if you want to go back to this and watch it, it's pretty, it's pretty fun to watch. And I'm just going to do this um, because they get creative, these teachers. Um, um, for another day, but um, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing, science and this type of science. Uh, so pandemic will not last forever. Hope is on the horizon, uh, but we're going to have to obviously. So if you've ever seen the filters on phones, there the kids are doing a filter on um, his teacher head. So he looks like a broccoli head. So they get creative with the kids. Um, here's another um, with him doing a science lab. All right, I am posting this video to your science stream uh, this morning. I'm gonna just go over something that really isn't related to what we're going to be discussing for science in the next uh, couple of quarters, actually. But because I actually had the materials on hand, normally I would bring them into class and sort of just talk about them anyway, uh, and then we would move on. But since you guys aren't here, 
and these materials will uh, soon be gone. I figured I would just post a quick video just to sort of show you some of the neat stuff uh, about this particular. So he's um, going to be bringing out uh, dry ice. So that's why he had to bring it in today because he had the dry ice today. Um, some of our career and tech students, um, this is our natural resources. They are practicing some of their um, digging. I don't know if you've seen the backyard, um, but they do practice digging in the backyard of the school. And this program has um, quite a bit of enrollment, um, in-person enrollment. So the way CTE is um, designing is the days that they are in, they're doing the lab requirements. And the days that students are remote, they're doing the instructional component and maybe some extensions of labs. So we had students in our welding program. Um, we asked the question, what keeps them engaged in Mr. Conklin's class? And let's hear what they have to say. Well, Mr. Conklin keeps us engaged by just every day is different with every project we do with welding applications. It keeps us engaged by keeping everything self-motivated. So what you want to work on is what you end up doing. So it makes you want to actually come to school. Mr. Conklin brings outside knowledge from job sites that we wouldn't get in the classroom. And here's a student demonstrating um, their some of their hands-on learning during their hybrid. Oh, I'll just keep moving on. Um, this is our st some of the feedback um, components of student assessment um, has been integrated into the new visions program. So they do a presentation and project-based learning where they're having kids work on projects and coming back for their feedback. So this is part of their assessment. Ayushi, Ayushi, you want to give her some feedback? Um, I just want to start with how you pronounce all of the hard words really well. It's all really short, you didn't struggle at all. You did it um, better when you presented, and I was, I don't know, I was really blown away. You did a really good job. Oh, let me go back quick. And of course, our culinary, and I put the apple fritter demonstration on here because it's getting close to the holidays, so you're going to want to probably watch this one. Hi everybody, Chef Jay here. Uh, in talking about chapter 41, quick breads and batters, I'd like to go ahead and do a little demo here of a recipe that's in Google Classroom for apple fritters. I suggest that if you make these recipes at home, you should cut them in half, if not even by uh, a quarter, uh, cut it down to 25% of the recipe. So an apple fritter is basically and our early childhood. So they have students who are also engaging with our with younger students at Liberty. And so they have kind of a three prong approach. They are making puppets and doing a puppet show for the younger students that they are working with. Me and the cat, me and the cat, the baby made the dog. The family also owns the home and they have many animals. One so you'll see here the, the students, students are in person and remote putting on a puppet show all together and this will be presented to the elementary students and i'll stop sharing and mr wright is going to show you about google classroom <laughs> oh. uh hello good evening everybody uh Thanks for being here. Um, I was really enjoying some of those videos, I have to say. Um, even though it's kind of tough, it's it's um, it's definitely a learning experience uh, to work so remotely. I'm sure it's sharpening some of our skills. Uh, really, now, doesn't everybody or everybody should be doing some sort of hybrid style class, even when we have full engagement with students in the classroom. We still use these learning management systems like Google. Um, there's an other ones as well, but the Google Classroom is pretty good. So I'm going to show you what we're doing in the middle school, and I'm going to show my screen. Bear with me while I set this up and just give you a incredibly brief view of what we're doing in the high school as um, content or, you know, sub subject teachers, let's say. So um, this would be my basic classroom page. Um, if you don't mind, can I get a couple thumbs up? Can you see my screen, everybody? Okay, good, thank you so much. I usually use the Google Classroom, but we're using Zoom right now. So this would be my class. I have a homeroom. I have um, Miss 
Uh, Miss Backman is my TA, so she has a tutoring section. I have a tutoring, we have breakout classrooms. I have several sections. I have a demo that I try stuff on. We see a nice little staff support. Uh, I also am a collaborator on several other teachers where um, the students will actually come into my room because it's a hybrid. So the hybrid classes, students will come in and I'll kind of act like the uh, avatar teacher where the I'll put the teacher on my uh, on my board and turn the laptops, Chromebooks, so they're interactive with the teacher and I can give them supplies or do whatever I need. So those teachers can be remote, but yet still in the same school. It's kind of odd, but it, it works. Um, so those classes in which, in which that's the case, I have, I am a teacher collaborator in those classes as well. And um, it, it's pretty interesting. I'm definitely getting education some things I maybe didn't know so much about. Uh, Mr. Pachano's classes are very fun and I always love art. So, you know, everything we touch and engage with is really art. So I always really like that as well. So I get to be an art teacher kind of, and I get to be a history teacher kind of, and I don't have to do any of the work, which is awesome. So um, what I'm going to show you today is just an incredibly brief look at what a Google Classroom, and I'm not going to even claim that mine is any good, but um, I'm actually more of a Schoology guy. I don't know if anyone used Schoology before. I used Schoology for a long time, but Google does have some really great things. Actually, the best thing about Google is how collaborative it is. Google collaboration is, is the best. Uh, I'm going to give you a little look at that. I'm going to give you a little bit look at my, this is actually my hybrid class, but right now it has been all virtual. So in the stream, um, we, this is what kind of gets sent out to the kids email. Oh, that went a little too quick. Pardon me. Um, the, anything I post in here, anything that gets posted, gets sent to each one of my students in the class. And uh, I believe the collaborators get sent into their um, email. So they get an email alarm and they get something on their calendar. And you can, um, calendars in the next one, sorry. Um, and so this is what got sent out to the kids today um, or yesterday. Um, and, you know, last week and, and, you know, some students will have little countdowns and they can post and kind of collaborate with their class. Like I was saying, Google is very collaborative. Um, kids post here. I'll post schedule changes. I'll remind them their schedules, um, you know, and uh, as well as uh, Ms. Backman can add things to this or any other collaborator can as well. Um, a little bit on the back end. Uh, the students don't see this exactly. They see something very similar, but what it does is it shows all of the assessments, assignments, and whatever else I put out there for them. It also shows them which ones they did or didn't do. So they kind of have this way of having instant feedback. Well, I'm going to get more on that as well. Because when they do something, they get feedback and they can see that it's done. Um, you can see that I have one turned in that I haven't graded yet. This is just ugh, hard to be. Very sensitive computer. Um, so this is what we did today. We did a thing called Edpuzzle. This is one of the many platforms that we use. Um, you could use it anywhere, but I guess kind of some of you are probably aware that we can't just send kids out to YouTube. We can't just send them out to different platforms willy nilly. We have to make sure that their information isn't being gleaned. So what we do is we run through uh, this platform called Edpuzzle. And what Edpuzzle does is it's a tool that allows teachers to have guided tours guided questions through videos that we post through here. And a really great thing about this one, and this is just one of the many um, tools that we can use, and gosh, there are so many tools, um, is we can play these videos and basically the students answer guided questions along the way. They can't skip over it. They can't click out of it. They have to go through it. And as soon as they finish it, they get feedback as to how well they did, how, how good their understanding was from whatever parameters I put out there for them. And then I get a, a message in my grade book to take a look. And you can see right here, it says, I signed it to three. Actually, is this the right kid? Yeah. I signed it to three. One turned it in and um, some I have to grade. So these were automatically graded. By the way, it makes everything 100. I don't want this to be 100. I will change that later. But I can see that um, these students got varying levels of understanding. And this one I haven't graded yet. So I haven't looked on that and clicked it yet. And then these three students, they um, they have to do that still. And I can just see that on a cursory glance without going into the um, minutia as to what they're doing. So I have, I really kind of start almost every day with a small video or some sort of media presentation where the kids kind of go through that. Um, I also post 
notes and labs here. Um, what I really like about notes is I have, I'll have like copies of notes and transport cheat sheets and what have you. And what I can do is I can add slides. Well, the kids aren't in class taking notes. Some of them don't have the dexterity. Some of them don't want to do it for various reasons, can't do it for various reasons. And what I basically do is we set up these notes and these were actually given to me. Um, I got to edit them a little bit, but this was given out. These were done by the BOCES earlier in the year. And they're basically just guided. They're, you know, they have the object objectives, essential questions you put in here. Um, they're guided. Students will, should answer questions within this. And what I can do and what my TA does as I'm going through it in class is she will make sure the students are um, following along and doing some of the activities that were given to them or assigned to them. So every single student gets their own copy. They get to have their own um, answers and we kind of go through the material that way and I can check up and watch them as they're going through that to check for engagement, check for, you know, accountability, completeness, accuracy, all those sorts of things. And really what's great about it is we as teachers can go into those individual files for those students and give them help. Maybe they're having a hard time moving something or maybe they understand this or we can type it in and give them hints. And that's a really powerful tool to be doing in real time as if we're looking over the shoulder of the student onto their page and they're at home. It's a really amazing tool. Okay, so I chatted a little bit about that. Um, you know, this week we had a, I, I teach science, so there's a lot of tools out there. This is, a, this is a virtual microscope. We're supposed to do a microscope lab. So what do you do? Eh, they're out there. There's one online. Um, I don't know if anyone here wanted to see we don't have any arachnophobes, do we out there? Because if so, then this is a bee leg, okay? But I think it might be a spider. So basically what we do here is we um, have this microscope, virtual microscope, and we can, you know, focus it. We can change the, um, you know, and there's lots and lots and lots of different slides. And we can go through and do labs like this and lots and lots of scientific companies um, and, you know, McGraw-Hill and other types of textbook companies have a lot of these slides. So we try to do this. This is kind of dry. This looks like a regular lab. Other things we do is um, we'll try to make games, you know, having it be fun. This one's uh, one on evolution. This is Darwin's Who Wants to Live a Million Years, where you're supposed to show the values of uh, genetic diversity and what's... Uh, and resilience from shocks to the system. And that's how you really, that's the strategy to get your credit to last a million years. And honestly, that I'm going to use that the segue. Almost I'm going to use that the segue. Um, I want to think about that with the diversity to resist shocks to the system. Um, kids, <sighs> kids are having a lot of shocks to their personal systems right now. And having that resilience, having that diversity, having that strength from that is actually important for them too. I want to talk about that a little later. Um, and then there's other games. Gosh, I've been on this for an hour. I started this when we started the class today. Um, so anyway, what also I'll do is I'll do little simple little games or just try to get vocab and there's concepts and there's purpose game, which is really great. And the kids don't have to um, put their names and I can put this through my Google uh, classroom as well. And just, just a little, it's a fun game for vocabulary in the beginning. There's so many things out there. Uh, one more thing about uh, Edpuzzle is, great thing about Edpuzzle is you, you can write your own questions or you can take other people's questions because um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But if you do want to make it directed towards any particular student or any particular skill you want to work on, you can do that and you can get videos from a number of platforms. Okay, so that's what we're doing in the high school. Um, I want to chat a little bit about what we're seeing in the high school. Uh, I have some notes here, but I'm not even going to go with it. Um, we have had a, an issue with engagement. Um, and one of those issues looks like attendance. That's a symptom. And uh, so we had this conversation last week. Are we okay talking about this on this part? You know, this is, um, I was just going to show you this, but maybe just for a moment, we'll talk about this. Um, Attendance is, is a symptom of engagement, and there's a bunch of different reasons why students are coming, aren't coming to school, and um, we've had these, we've had, it, it's, it was mentioned many times earlier in this conversation, and I just kind of want to bring it back to, and there's going to be Q&As for later, that um, 
we teachers in the high school feel that we're really taking care of Maslow first. We're taking care of personal needs. We're taking care of kids' needs for safety and self-assurance. And a lot of these issues with engagement are based upon those. And if we can work on those, it's a lot easier to get into Bloom's, which is these higher end understanding and education here. Um, I personally have driven to many children's houses, dropping off Chromebooks or hotspots, or I've even been doing laundry for some of them. Uh, the kids who I help show up to class more. They're more engaged. They know I care about them. The kids, some of the kids are new to this school and they came to a school where they're virtual and it's really hard for them to feel accounted, hard for them to belong. But once they start making friends with each other, and if we give space for that in the class, which we do, attendance goes up dramatically. Um, today, none of the students who I drove to their house to drop something off for missed class. And I know that that just might be some, uh, you know, uh, interesting coincidence, but I don't think so. I don't either. So, and the students who I did their laundry, they, I folded their sweatshirts, they show up to class. And I know that's simple. And if we can do that in every direction, that's, that's something. Um, this is a great time for us to sharpen our skills. Uh, it's very exciting, but it's now that we're in the middle of it, it's kind of hard. So I, I hope everyone's having some fun with it and, you know, getting something out of it. And I, I really hope the students are too. I have definitely, definitely felt, felt and found lots of success so far this year. But sometimes the numbers don't show that. Um, I know there's going to be a Q&A later. I hope you enjoyed my little tiny cursory glance of my class. And I see... Um, uh, Linda, do you have a question for me? I'd love to answer I it. I do. I have a question for you. Um, Jennifer, in her presentation, she made it very clear that her young students had parents sitting right next to them. Right. Do you, what is the relationship of parents and teachers with your kids? Oh, thanks. You know, I have this, I, 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 you know, I wrote so many notes to chat about today, but I always just write notes and then just ramble. And thank you for saying that because that is that is really such an important thing. If I call home, ever oh, so I'm going to even back this up. I picked up the first day of school. I picked up to a angry parent, and that parent was accusational to the point where I was worried of legal recourse. So I chatted with my principal. But before that, I said, you know, I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate you calling. And I know that you're upset right now, but anything you ask me to do, I'll make sure I answer the question as quick as possible. But what, when you call, I know you care about your child. And that means so much to you. It means I found an ally on you. And I tell you, that guy is my best friend. I did he did actually have an issue where he couldn't leave the house. And I ran some technology to the house that day and he is in my corner and that student does not miss a class and that student does have an A and he is resilient, that young man in my class. And when he gets something wrong, he feels good about it and he's very sharing because he feels that I'm on his team. I'm an extension of his family. I know I'm treated that way. I have another parent who um, told me that I had the wrong number and hung up on me. <laughs> student is not doing as well. Intellectually, the one whose parent hung up on me probably um, has more of an advantage than the other one, but that was a little sad for me. But you know what I did when I got hung up on? I said, that is now my kid. I'm gonna work for them twice as hard. And- um, So, okay, can we um, clone you? And are you already tenured? Otherwise you're already tenured. I'm just the sub, actually. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Stop it. No. Stop it. I am. <laughs> but not technically. No, you can't. You know, you can what you're doing, what, what you're doing and what you're saying is what teaching at its core level is all about. Oh it my is gosh, thank meeting you. the child wherever the child is at. That's it right. is that dive into who they are, what's in the way of them, connecting okay. with the parent, doing the damn laundry. I get it. 
And okay, when you're ready I to showed cry. up at a kid's house way back in the day, <laughs> people thought I was crazy because I actually went to a child's house. That's what you're doing that's making the difference. So thank you. And thank you. And I don't know what else to say because you're a sub. But Mr. Wright, you're not oh, really a sub, are you? I am, but that's okay. But listen to this. You want to cry? You guys ready for this? You got two. Oh my God. Be worth it. So this one student hasn't spoken like all year. He's got some problems, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of our students, this guy, he's like my, he's going he's gonna to be my guy, you know? <laughs> so anyway, he hasn't spoken. He's having a hard time. He never went to school last year. He's in class every day now, but that's mm -hmm. the story. But this is what he tells me. I said, if you, I asked him, I asked the kids, if you could give anybody a gift for Christmas, what would it be? I said, you have all the money in the world. I just want to hear about you. You know, just like a couple minutes between classes. And he crosses his arms and I don't celebrate Christmas. Said, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Are you, uh, are you uh, Jewish? Are you, you know, you know is there is a religious uh, belief? He said, no. He said, my best friend killed himself on Christmas two years ago. Yes. So I'm very sorry to hear that. I said, you know, I, um, I don't think your friend wanted to take Christmas away from you forever. And I think that one day you're going to have to, you're going to have to, um, give Christmas back to yourself. So what I did was I asked Blanton, I said, listen, can I give this kid a gift? And they're like, she's like, yeah, why? I was like, she's like, yeah, you know, un with means and stuff. I like, don't, you know, just run it by us. And what I'm going to do, I got the kid a gift card and I want him to buy something to, from his friend to that he's going to hold on to that's going to give Christmas back to him. I want, I want that. It's from me, from his friend to give Christmas back to him. And I think that'd be really meaningful this week. Uh, and I don't know, maybe that's not going to make you cry, but I tell you, I'm doing it. Though. I'm going to, I'm getting this kid back. <laughs> I might You're even dress up it. like Santa. Okay. So anyway, Ray, not to we, we want to thank you. Oh this yeah. No worries. Very, very, very informative and very fun. On and, behalf um, of our children. Yes. Thank you. And, and we're, glad, we're glad to have met both you and Jennifer. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this presentation up. So let me get back to my screen. Natasha. Yep. Can I just, I, Randall had made a point that I totally forgot to discuss, but, and this is not just me, this is our entire White Sulphur Springs and GMOD. And I know that our pick in the high school does the same, but with our PBIS this year, we worked really hard at making sure our students earned um, rewards for when they were doing the right thing. And many of us had Google Slides where we presented to the students either in our meets or sent it out to them from the teacher to the student in an email, choices that they could pick from, from our prize box or our like reward store. And all the teachers and all the people that work here have worked hard at bringing in toys and items that they know the kids love. And then we mailed it to them. Um, we also did a an activity where I made bags with sand and sand art, and we mailed that or delivered it to every student in the White Sulphur building for them to do it at home. Um, I know myself and many other teachers have done the same thing, kind of as what Randall said, that we've delivered packages to our kids' houses. Um, we deliver the rewards that they earn. Also, my class, I know for a fact, and some others, we made crafts for them to make during Thanksgiving time or now for Hanukkah, Kwanzaa and Christmas. So, and I agree 100% with Randall that it has made parents make a better connection with you, the teacher and the kids when they know you show up for them. So I do agree that that, that is, and I can tell you that having worked here for quite some time, I do feel all the teachers feel that way. They are very vested. They go out of their way to go deliver I can probably name you every teacher or classroom staff in this in our buildings that are doing something special for the holidays for their students because they want them to feel like we love them. So yes, it, I feel like BOCES does have that going for them. Wow. And, that, and that's, that's what wonderful. makes us, yeah. that's what makes us BOCES. That's what gives kids that extra special touch. Um, I do want to say um, thank you to our two teachers. But some of the takeaways, and um, this was interesting because we did some practice <laughs> runs on our presentation today, um, that we all came to the same conclusion. And the social emotional learning piece, um, as Mr. Wright touched to, and Jen as well, has to be our priority. Um, our PBIS interventions help. The 
principal teacher staff connections help. Um, mental health is a huge priority. I don't know if you, NPR just released, a, um, they were talking about a study just released by um, Harvard today about mental health in youth. And um, ongoing support to our staff, that's a huge piece to keep them motivated, to keep students motivated. Um, the daily check-ins, the counselor outreaches, the welfare checks that we do, um, we're doing more this year. Um, we have to be the facilitators of equity and access for technology for our kids. Um, the, we have to be the collaboration and communication experts with our parents. And we know that attendance is a, is a hardship for everybody. It's seen throughout the country, we know that. And um, how do we make our lessons most engaging? And how do we make parents, and we heard some examples today, uh, play a role in our student attendance? And that's their engagement. Um, further, we found that teachers who are providing the multimodality um, that you're seeing today, um, they're interactive, they're flexible. The one piece that we learned from the research was um, evaluating what instruction really looks like. It's not what we typically see um, in a traditional school. It has to be different for kids. And so having that flexibility, that teachers have that flexibility to work on in their classroom and the interactive nature of their activities um, has been a bonus for us. Um, the human connection is key to learning. And you heard it firsthand from our two teachers. Um, we also know that there's a need for continued discussion about best practices and student engagement. And um, we all as a school community have to be supportive in teacher work. And teacher work requires instructional risk taking and trying out new things. And it has to be a safe place in our schools for teachers to be able to do that from the administrative level to the board level um, to the parent level um, that teachers can take risks and try new things. Um, some of the things we're doing to improve, we are ongoing teams, like I said, in our instructional multi-tiered systems to support team. Um, we're building our framework this year. Um, we're using the partnership to do that, the regional partnership, um, which is state-sponsored um, to build our MTSS. Um, we're, we actually just found out today that we are part of the Harvard Kennedy School Project, which was looking at absenteeism. So we're going to be talking about it um, in our principal groups to evaluate our attendance procedures and find new ways to engage um, absenteeism. And um, in our, our local um, group, the Assistant Superintendents for Instruction started talking about um, creating a countywide focus group to talk about student engagement and attendance because they're finding the same issues as well. Um, we started a social justice courageous conversations group um, led by our wonderful superintendent and it's continuing um, from the summer through now. And um, ongoing discussions with our, our networks within the county and within the state. Um, so between Maria, myself, um, Dr. DeFore, um, Jen, Susan, everybody, we're taking everything we learned and bringing it back here and with our principals and local um, constituents and participating and encouraging participation in ongoing professional development for all staff. Any questions? I know it's a lot. <laughs> Before, so Natasha, uh, can you unshare your screen, please? Yep. So just very quickly before we go to questions, I want to thank uh, Jen and Randall, Natasha, Adam, and Megan. Um, if you look at the chat, you'll see Randall made a <laughs> slight entry. Randall is a long-term sub. Uh, he's a full-time employee, but HR is working with Randall on getting his certifications transferred over to New York. So he, 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 his classification is long-term sub until we can appoint him uh, permanently once his licensure uh, is worked out. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, I'm uh, always half joking about everything. <laughs> no, no you, you, did, you did great, Randall. It's just, I, I sort of look at concern on some of the board members' faces and I'm glad I saw uh, you put the clarification in. So does anybody have any other questions for uh, Natasha, uh, Randall, or Jen? I want to thank you from the whole board for these presentations, they were probably some of the more fun presentations we've 
we've gotten to see and you know we've been we as a board have been terribly concerned with what this looks like what this education and this learning looks like and um i thank all the teachers and i think we've had a lovely group of teachers that were going and administrators i don't want to leave you guys out but uh from the board our heartfelt thanks for all you're doing guys um, we have some truly wonderful things going on in our classrooms virtually and in person at Sullivan Bosey's. I consistently get stuff from my colleagues around the state about all of the wonderful things that they're doing. And I don't look at them because I know the things that we're doing here are all that really matter and what they're doing for our kids. And yes, engaging them, as Randall said, can be challenging, especially as they get older but our teachers go that extra mile. This gives you an idea of what we're doing. We're very excited about being invited uh, to participate in this uh, Harvard Kennedy School uh, absence study because this was something the board was uh, uh, curious about. So we are working very hard because that's what we're here to do, to work hard on behalf of our kids. And whether it's doing laundry or dropping a computer off uh, or uh, making a uh, welfare check. Um, even our SRO, uh, Deputy Centron, um, for the first couple of days we were closed last week, uh, he came in every day because he still had a list of families he needed to contact because they had fallen off the grid and he was trying to help the teachers track these kids down. So it's an effort on everyone's part. And again, Natasha, Jen, Randall, Adam, Megan, and all of the teachers whose clips you've seen, uh, thank you very much for everything that you do every day. Thank you all. Thank you. Back to business, I guess. So what we have also next, uh, Linda, is Susan is going to share her screen and we have uh, phase one of our budget presentations. We will uh, just do two small snippets uh, of it tonight and we will um, dedicate most of our next meeting uh, to the remaining portions of it. Okay. So here's all the boring stuff that supports all that awesome instruction in our classrooms and all of our great programs. So let's just start this. Just have to. Okay, so as Bob said, we're going to chunk our budget presentation into um, components. So tonight we're going to talk about um, what makes up a BOCES budget. We're going to focus on the administrative budget. We're going to briefly talk about transfer charges, and we are going to do an overview of the BOCES rental budget. So as most of you know, there are three components to um, the BOCES, bu BOCES budget. Um, the administrative budget, which is the only portion of the BOCES budget that our component school districts vote on the capital and rental budget, which is all the facilities that we rent or that we own and need to do um, capital projects and, and renovations and enhancements on. And then the bulk of our budget is our program and service budget. And that is all of our COSERS. Um, so as most of you know, I always describe our program and, and COSER budget as 50 little mini budgets within our, um, our whole entire general budget because they are all self-sustaining. So career and tech is its own independent budget and each ratio in our special ed program is its own budget, all dead, et cetera. Um, so tonight I really wanna focus on the administrative budget. Um, this is your budget. Um, the Board of Education's um, budget is included, the district superintendent, central administration, the business office um, and what's called other post-employment benefits, which is basically all of our retirees health insurance and our Medicare B reimbursement. And that's a statutory requirement um, by law. Um, OPEB has to be included in the BOCES administrative budget. So what's included in our administrative budget from a staffing perspective? So we have 1.59 FTEs in certified um, staff, which is basically Bob and myself and we have almost five um, FTEs in uncertified um, staff. So supporting the Board of Education is your district clerk, which is a part of our secretary to the superintendent district clerk position. You have a claims auditor and you have a treasurer. 
In the business office, we have a variety of people um, that support our accounting needs, our billing needs, our accounts receivable and accounts payable, um, and HR. So a portion of um, my position, we have an accountant, a portion of Keith's position, a portion of Jen's position as a director of HR. We have a HR support uh, person, the HR specialist, and we have a principal account clerk database, a principal account clerk, and a senior account clerk. Um, and then supporting central administration is again a part of my salary, a part of Jen's salary, and a part of the HR specialist and a senior typist. Um, you probably are asking, well, why are these FTEs in fragments? And it's because we all support other COSERs and other services within um, the BOCES. And so that's why it's divided up like that. Um, we pool, started pooling our clerical charges a couple of years ago. So we all buy in based on our FTEs to what we basically a transfer charge. And that helped us stabilize our, our rates in all of our coasters because if you were a coaster or even in our case, the administrative budget that had the most senior clerical person, you might be spending a larger amount than somebody else. And so by doing that, we all pay the same for clerical support. So it stopped the ebbs and flows in our rates um, across the organization. Um, outside of um, salaries, oops, I just messed up here, sorry. Salaries and fringe benefits, which represent about 80% of our total budget, whether you're in an administrative COSER or a CTE COSER or special ed, obviously our supplies and our contractual expenses so when we're reviewing the um, administrative budget with you in a couple of months, I wanted you to just have a highlight of like what the major areas of contractual expenses are. So for the Board of Education, it's your legal services, our liability insurance with NICER, memberships and conferences. For the district superintendent's office, it's the DS um, and SED meetings and all the requirements um, that are associated with that position on a state level, um, memberships and conferences. On the business office side, we have our uh, WinCap software, and it's not just financial software um, for our accounting now. We use WinCap Web for time and attendance. Um, so we have definitely enhanced our, um, our use of technology, which was a great thing for us, um, particularly when COVID hit. Um, we have auditing, you know, we have an external auditor, memberships and conferences and, and PD, which the great thing about PD now is most of it is online. Um, for central admin, we have our um, HR software, which is the new talent ed program. And that again has been fabulous. I, Jen and I talk all the time. I don't know how we would have handled hiring without um, the talent ed software during uh, COVID with all of our applications online. We save time, we save, we save paperwork. It used to take us days to get paperwork from you know the main campus over to here and through the offices for signature. So that has been great. Um, all of the postage is done at a central admin. You know, we have a receptionist that mans the door and does the mail. And the, that's like a, one of the major things over on central admin and then the uh, memberships and conferences. And those are not huge um, components, but memberships and conferences are part of all of those budgets. So I wanted to touch base a little bit on retirees health insurance and Medicare B premiums, A, because it's a, a required component of our administrative budget and because it's a, such a large part of um, our administrative budget. So at the current time, we have approximately 130 um, retirees and that comes from all um, parts of our organization, whether you're um, an administrator, part of CSEA, part of SCBTA. Our estimated um, expenses in terms of retirees health insurance uh, that we're projecting for next year, and again, these are all tentative numbers, is $989,198. Um, that represents about 45 to 50% of our administrative budget. Um, and that is not atypical for um, BOCES throughout the state. Um, the uh, retirees health insurance is the largest part of anybody's um, administrative budget. If we were to take that number and kind of roll it forward and look at it as part of our entire general fund budget, because in a school district, that's how you would look at that expense. It would be about three to 5% of our entire general fund budget. And that's pretty comparable with most of our component school districts. We did a study a couple of years ago. Um, it's probably time to renew that, but we were at par with most of them. The other part of the OPEB, the other post-employment benefits is the Medicare B reimbursement. 
Um, and we're estimating that that is going to be about 222, just over $222,000 in the upcoming 21-22 school year. So, um, the, med a Hold on just a second. the Medicare B reimbursement is also a retiree benefit. Yes, right? that's even why it's part it's, of OPEB. Yeah, um, even though it's on a separate line, it's still part of the retiree only. Um, right. That's not totally true, Carol. We do have a couple of people with special circumstances that they might have dependents um, based on disability, et cetera, that are eligible for that Medicare B reimbursement. We have a handful of those, but okay. those um, charges would come out of our COSERS for the active employees. And if you're retired, it comes out of this part of the, the budget. So we do have a little bit of that in other parts, but very little. So I just wanted to clarify for myself and for others, but that's really part of our retiree costs, not not an ongoing daily operational type cost. Well, it's part of the OPEB retirees benefit line item, I would characterize it, but it, it at the end of the day, our um, administrative budget is assessed on an ARWADA basis, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So it is part of the charge, the what I would call a day-to-day -day or an annual charge to our districts as they pay into our administrative budget on an ARWADA basis. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, transfer charges, I talked a little bit about how we pool um, you know, our clerical staff we also have obviously an operations and, and maintenance department. You know, we need to take care of our grounds, turn the lights on, heat the building. We have technology support, which in this day and age is like a, a critical function. I don't know what we would do without our fabulous tech team. Um, we have a public relations communications department. That's how we get our, you know, our services directory out, our messages. Um, I talked about the administrative assistance and we also started uh, pooling campus principals and assistant principals again, to assess um, those charges on a more equalized basis. So these are all um, examples of expenses that um, don't have um, revenues that come directly from the school districts or anything else. So they're like a cost center, but a cost center without a direct revenue. So we all pay in for the services that we use. So like O&M is divided up on a square footage basis and all the rest of the services are allocated to all of the divisions within the BOCES on a utilization basis. Um, then there's also some revenue generated coasters where we buy services. So like Maria's instructional support services department, all the wonderful PD that her staff provide, our programs like special ed and CTE, just like our districts have to buy into her coaster so that our staff can also avail themselves of all those wonderful PD opportunities. Same for health and safety. Just like we sell health and safety services to our district, whether it's um, asbestos testing or some of the professional development that's required or assistance with our district-wide safety plans that are required, we also buy into that service to support our needs. So our administrative budget is charged accordingly for all these shared expenses. So the point is we have to contribute to O&M and tech support and all of those other services that we use. Does that make sense? Some of you are nodding. Some of you are, I'm sorry, not as engaged. I don't have fun videos. I'll have to figure out how to do that next time. Um, this is just a, a sample of like what our administrative budget looks like. This is the current budget for the current year when we did the annual meeting, because obviously our 21-22 uh, budget is not ready yet. Just to give you a, a feel for um, how our um, different salary line items and contractual expenses, any cross contracts or the benefits that we have to um, pay for the employees that are part of the administrative budget, like how those are divided up and what percentage um, they represent of the whole administrative budget. And as you can see, what I said earlier, the retirees health insurance and the Medicare B reimbursement is the largest part of our admin budget, which our districts vote on. From a rental perspective, our BOCES um, rents a lot of space. Um, we're out in the hospital for our health OC programs um, and, and new visions. Unfortunately, that's tabled because of, of COVID, but we're hoping to return um, there when the world normalizes. Um, the Liberty Mall is our current um, BOCES office and conference center. I'll have to update the name of that um, entity in our spreadsheets. Um, 
Oops, sorry about that. Um, we rent space uh, from the Liberty Central School District. As you know, we are in the White Sulphur Springs building for our elementary program. We also rent space in their high school for IDT and our early childhood program. Um, the modular is our, our new um, eight classroom, what we refer to as the GMOD. So we have elementary special ed programs uh, there. The uh, SCCC is SUNY Sullivan. And as I believe you're all aware, we are over there for public safety. We're over there. We actually moved our um, health act programs and, and new visions programs over there. We're there for innovative design. So we definitely have expanded our footprint. Um, and then we always budget a little bit more in other. Um, and that's basically because we're a service provider. So at any given time, our districts could ask us to develop another program, add some additional coasters, and we need to have a little bit of um, funds budgeted for any extra facility space that we might need to meet um, a school district need. Does anybody have any questions about the rental budget? So I wanted to briefly talk about ARWADA, which is not an exciting topic, but ARWADA stands for Resident Weighted Average Daily Attendance. It's um, a critical piece of, of data and information for our school districts, not just for BOCES, but it drives other um, aid and funding sources for the districts. So um, it basically is the average number of pupils that are present and attendance has been obviously a topic of discussion for our board and for others um, present in each school each day. And there is an additional weighting for secondary students. So your elementary students are rated at just 1.0 and you get additional weightings for your secondary students in grades seven through 12 and obviously not full weighting if you um, have half day kindergarten. So why is this um, important? It's important because it, it drives how our WADA based um, uh, billings are assigned to uh, districts. And in this brief example, if District A and District B both have the same enrollment, 2000 students, neither district has um, half day kindergarten, but in my example, District A has less K-6 students than District B. Obviously, they're waiting for those students is less in district. I mean, and, and I'm sorry. And a 1,500, 7 through 12, and 1,000 in um, 7, 12 in District B, the waiting for those secondary students in District A is higher than it is in District B because I told you they get 1.25 for those students. So at the end of the day, District A has an ARWADA of 2200 and District B has an ARWADA of 2075. Again, because District A has more secondary students coming into school every day than District B. So obviously these numbers can fluctuate based on um, cohorts of enrollment in our school districts. So if you have, let's say 200 students in each grade level K-6, in a couple of years, those 200 cohorts are going to be in your secondary program, whereas you might have less students come in to replace those students, and obviously that's going to impact your ARWADA charges. So if these two districts with the same number of students, 2,000 each, had to pay into our administrative budget, and if we were charging $226 per ARWADA, you can see that District A would pay just over $497,000 and District B would be paying about $469,000 or close to it. I know it's complicated and, and wordy, but here's where we have to talk about the localized version of ARWADA. So this ARWADA is <coughs> comes straight from SED. I took this screenshot from Sam's. I'm sure there's some questions in, in regards to like why it looks like it does. And unfortunately at the current time, we don't have numbers for Roscoe and Livingston Manor. So we can't really assess anything on our WADA until um, that's updated because if we estimate it, it's gonna impact um, everybody. But our, our WADA keeps going down. And, and that has been the trend since um, 2005, 2006. So, some of us have been here for a longer period of time than others. And at one point in time, the county was just about at, at 12,000. So if I go back to 2005, 2006, the county's ARWADA was 11,250. 
and you can see how it's declined over the years and we are down to 9,459. So this becomes the divisor when we allocate expenditures. So obviously when that divisor is shrinking, the actual cost per ROI is going up at a higher rate, even if there were no change in our actual expenses. So flat expenses are still um, escalating and we know that our expenditures are, are not flat because we have contractual obligations, et cetera. So I'm not gonna um, belabor that uh, anymore. Can I just ask, can I ask a question? Sure. I'm just wondering how the virtual learning impacts this. How do we measure attendance with kids that are home? They click on, then they walk away. I don't know, how do we measure attendance this year? So the answer to that question, Carol, is for this year, the state has indicated that schools that are in a remote environment need to put a mechanism in place where they can interact with their kids in some fashion in order to mark them present for attendance. That can be through a Google Meet, that could be through a Zoom, that could be through an email, or that can be through a phone call home. So we do one of those kind of things with each Every student day. in Every order day to get our attendance. So when we're in a hybrid mode and we have, the teacher has 10 kids in front of them and the other 10 kids are at home, the teaching assistant is doing the Google Meet with the 10 kids that are home to count their attendance. Okay, all right, I get it. So a student sitting at home, working remotely, we need to take attendance and it counts towards this. All right. Why are the colors different? Well, the colors are different because I wanted to show you that only two school districts actually had increases in our water. So the blue represents districts that went up. So Fallsburg had the largest increase and Liberty went up slightly. And the numbers in red are because we are waiting for Livingston Manor and Roscoe um, to submit their ST3 so that their data gets uploaded to the SAM system. And Monticello and Monticello's went down tremendously. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and I would just add, and we've had fluctuations in districts um, throughout my time here. And we talk to the districts all the time at the superintendent's level, the business administrators level, etc. This data is only as good as the rep record keeping of all of us. So like every day that a teacher um, reports their attendance and we you know then upload that information that's why it's so important for people to pay attention to attendance and over the course of time i think almost every district has had to make a correction um, or go back and update some data and double check their records so i know that everybody gets um, frustrated with the amount of reporting and information that we all have to track at various levels throughout the organization but this is such a critical point because it drives so many things for the districts. Sure. And we emphasize that, you know, a lot. So, um, and we have been working with our districts to make sure that they have help that they need to um, submit these reports and, and get everything in. So in the interest of time, and I know that, you know, our world is not as exciting <laughs> as everybody else's, <laughs> um, videos I can find for, for January on maybe numbers dancing or something like that. But in January, we'll talk about, we'll just review, you know, that the budget has multiple components. We'll talk about our capital um, estimates and budget figures for the upcoming year. And then we'll dive into some of the individual COSER budgets um, and talk to you about some enrol enrollment trends and some things that we might anticipate changing. We'll go into transfer charges and how they impact um, the actual COSERs, meaning the instructional programs or instructional support or management services. Because as a reminder, everybody has their own budget, whether you're the 811 special ed program or you're the central business office. Um, we'll give you a little lesson in terms of how we calculate tuitions and program charges. Um, we'll talk to you about where a BOCES gets its revenues. Again, we're very different than a school district. Um, and we'll give you an overview of a couple of the grant programs um, that the BOCI still has. And I'm willing to answer any questions you may have, or Keith, if you have anything else to add. Nice job. I have fun kids here. <laughs> <laughs>
Didn't Keith do something with paper bags one year or something? <laughs> or kittens turtles and puppies. Or kittens. Kittens. He did something with kittens. <laughs> kittens and puppies. In buckets. Yep. Buckets, not bags. Buckets. That was it. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you, Susan, very much. And Natasha, thank you. And all the teachers that were here. And I'm glad they left us because we can be far less interesting than they were. Um, I'm going to move us ahead then to the consent agenda, which is item seven, and it includes um, all those things there. And what I need from you guys is I need, thank you, Carol, and thank you, Tony. <laughs> That's what I needed. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda by a show of hands, it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to move to the infamous claims audit report, which is always an interesting topic. Um, there were a few things on there, but they just are what they are. I guess it's difficult right now. Did everyone get a chance to look at this? There are really quite a number of things on there. Does anybody have a comment or a question? We have, we have Susan and Keith here. To, and Jen, of course, we can harass all of you over this, but I'm assuming, you know, with all the chaos that goes on, these little POs at the whole top of it um, just kind of slip around, I realize, but there's a lot, there are two very large ones. I don't know what Cranesville block is. That was um, the cement for the, um, the sidewalk repairs that our O&M department did. And, and to be honest, they put another PO in and they already had a blanket PO. So they really shouldn't have been on this list, but they forgot okay. that they had a blanket PO. So they really did have money encumbered for that expense. Um, and a couple of the, the POs like um, culinary, et cetera, were kind of carryovers of things that we had talked about in the yeah. past. But the timing of when these hit were before some of that re-education and the conversations had occurred. So I anticipate that you will see less of these in um, the month of January. Okay, so the open POs, people know they have blanket POs. Correct, and they just didn't think about that and went and put a, a new one in in that specific case. And then in, in the repairs, because if you think back to the month before we had a repair on there, so uh -huh. this was like the parts came in and it um, was done after the fact, but it was prior to the conversation um, with the department and the staff members that take care of this. So I think that they understand their charge and hopefully we won't see as many of these going forward. Great, thank you so much. This was informational. Now the treasurer's report. Um, Usually we depend on Linda to comment on this. Got it. Sue, did you look at it? Make him, we need to adopt it, so I need your motion, Sue. Okay. Thank you. I need a second, please. Tony, thank you. Okay, any questions about it or anything? All right, all those in favor, may I, you please raise your hand? And it is unanimous and um, we will all, Gene, you'll take note that we're let one less on unanimous because somehow Ken disappeared in this. Yes. Good. Yeah, I, I made note that he left. Thank you. Okay, moving on now to per, number nine, personnel matters. This also is an action item, so I need a motion first to start. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Tony. Um, there are several sheets in the personnel thing here. Questions or comments? Carol Park. Carol Park. Carol, you're muted, honey. Unmute yourself. Keith, you're going to retire again? <laughs> yes, again, I for real. <laughs> I didn't accept it, though. Oh, I know. true. Linda balked at it, so I don't know. I told I wasn't accepting it when he said Is, it, is that all it takes? I don't think it matters. He's retiring, he said. Oh. What happened to the point four after the point nine or point six? That was somebody else's, um, I don't know, she had a crazy I, in her mind. I don't know. I should have got it in writing. Yeah. All right. You'll be still there. 
but we still have them for the rest of the year. Yeah, you got nine, nine months. Yep. Nine more months. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other questions, people? Okay, you noticed that there were two attachments at the bottom of it, both date, dated today, December 15th and December 15th. Yeah, see that. Anybody have any questions on those? Okay, then if nobody has any questions or commentary, I am going to ask for a vote. Please raise your hand if you're in favor. Thank you very much. Again, unanimous. Okay, we are on food service update, which is informational. Any questions or comments on it? Did everybody understand everything in it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it was quite a lengthy uh, report. But I imagine it was, may I assume that that was all requirement for something, that food service report? Um, it, yes, it is, is okay. required. And we also wanted the board to understand that we had left the National um, School Lunch Program and moved over to the Summer Food Service Program um, for the very reasons that I wrote in the memo to, to Bob. A, it gives us more flexibility um, in our menu planning. B, it gives us a higher reimbursement um, when we are claiming our meals. And C, it gives us flexibility to support our school districts and our students. Um, like in this remote world, if, you know, Liberty or somebody had trouble, we could provide meals um, to our students and students could come and pick up meals here. Like we could, like I know that some districts, instead of um, transporting meals, they had people come to the district to pick up. So we would um, be able to, to do all of that. Um, and then the attachment that was rather lengthy, the, the like summary report was just a, a page, was our food service uh, safety plan. And that requirement came out, I wanna say it was like 2006 and Dawn's on, so she can correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. Um, and then it had to be updated. Um, and basically the update in the um, copy that we provided to you was um, provisions to address COVID. Um, and I'll just say that um, our shared food service department, which includes Dawn as our director of food service for the BOCES, and she also manages the Monticello Central School District. And then we have Dara, who is shared between Liberty and Fallsburg, have done a yeoman's job in a, um, a very challenging environment, uh, to say the least, uh, since March. So not only are we feeding students, um, and, and Dawn knows my drill better than anybody else, especially this time of year with snow days. Like we always, I don't even have to say what I'm gonna say. She goes, I know we're closing early and you wanna make sure food goes home. Like she is just so committed to our kids. And now we're able to also provide um, meals as a, a site if we need to. Um, and I will give Dawn and Daryl all the credit for keeping us compliant because of the two of them, in my opinion, are the best food service directors in our region. So we are very lucky to have them and to have all of the things that they do for us. I raised my teacup to that. I'm gonna cry. Park. <laughs> did, I, did I get it all right, Dawn? And you made me cry. Oh. <laughs> well, well, the best part is, the best part is Dawn does it all you know, behind the scenes. So we don't even have to really get involved of, other than her educating us on how Absolutely. it works. Absolutely. That's she wonderful. It all. And, and we thank you for it. Carol Park. You, Susan, is, is that a trend of schools? Is it is to go to the summer feeding program? I, I believe so. And Dawn, or Dawn, you're connected on the statewide level. So you know more about that than I do. So I'll let you take that question. Is it a trend? Um, it's, it's more of a product. Um, when COVID first hit in March, USDA gave us the opportunity to switch meal plans. So a lot of the districts that were already CEP, it was easy for them. They didn't have to deal with too much tracking. Some of us that were in um, NSLP, it's a different meal plan. It gets tricky. It, it was out of necessity to get waivers to stray from our normal type of regulated feedings in-house. So the districts did that in order to hit food out to the community. 
The components are the same? The meal components, is it different? Slight variations. There's actually less components. A fruit and vegetable is a combined component in the summer feeding plan. So that's a little bit of the, if we're going to get into cost savings. Portions are the same. One major hurdle we don't have to deal with during summer feeding is our wonderful vegetable subcategories and making sure that the kids are getting all five of their different vegetables in one week. So, so we I don't have purple vegetables to worry about? Oh, back to the colors. That's what I was going to say. Thank when God. Don't have to worry it's about just, the colors anymore. That was just, so funny. It just relaxes the, the regulations enough to do mass production and service. Nice. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are down to the wire here. Robert? Have a good night. <laughs> good man. Um, and finally, any statements from anyone on the board? I'm not going to call your name. I'm just going to watch you all shake your heads. Good. Then, so Linda, Kathy one thing, just yes, one sir. thing on behalf of uh, everyone uh, on the call from senior management, uh, our principals, faculty, staff, and our students, we want to wish each and every one of you a very happy holiday season and a happy, healthy, prosperous new year free of COVID. Amen. Um, then Kathy, you're on. Oh, before we go, let's not forget what Bob told us about our Thursday morning meeting. And if you run out of any kind of electric, <laughs> just keep, keep trying and get back to us because he really needs us there for this. That's nine o'clock? Nine o'clock. Um, the same link as now, or will you send a new link out? No, there, there's a new link was sent to your email. I'll send it again. Okay. I'm, it might be there. I just didn't check it yet. And Kathy, you are on this time. She made a very quiet motion to adjourn. <laughs> I need a second. I'll second. Thank you, Sue. All those in favor. Happy and healthy to everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.